So hello and a warm welcome to this afternoon's Unify event, which is Bradford, a place of sanctuary and peace building. So Bradford has a strong history of peace activism and of welcoming those who seek sanctuary. So over the next 90 minutes, we're going to be here about its history of peace activism and be meeting some of those who've sought sanctuary in the city and how they've made Bradford their home. We'll also learn about the amazingly diverse and creative range of projects that seek to support sanctuary seekers. But to start, I'd like to now hand over to Nikki Pierce from the University, who's going to be welcoming you all to this event. Nikki. Hello, my name is Nikki Pierce and I'm Academic Registrar at the University of Bradford and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all to this event. At the University of Bradford, our vision is a world of inclusion and equality of opportunity where people want to and can make a difference. We're a place-based, socially inclusive institution rooted in the Bradford region and we take very seriously our role and responsibility in driving social mobility and contributing to the economic, social and cultural life of our communities. As Owen has said, Bradford as a city has a long history of welcoming migrants from all parts of the world, and this has contributed to the rich history and cultural diversity that we enjoy today. As a city of sanctuary, Bradford welcome those who come, providing a place of safety and welcome for those who have fled situations of extreme danger in their own countries. The University of Bradford is proud to be a University of Sanctuary and to work alongside the city to welcome and support asylum seekers and refugees. We offer a range of support for those who wish to study with us, including sanctuary scholarships, and we work alongside the City of Sanctuary to create a city that is more inclusive and welcoming, where those seeking sanctuary can enrich our city and be recognised for their contribution. So I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, Bradford, a place of sanctuary and peace building, which will explore the city's history of peace activism. And there'll be opportunities to hear from those who've sought sanctuary in the city and made it their home. So I'm now going to back, hand back to Owen, uh, he'll take you into the event. Okay, so thank you very much, Nikki. So um, just to introduce myself a little more fully, I'm Owen Green. I'm a professor at the uh, university in the Department of Peace Studies and International Development, where I'm research director. And, um, and so, Luckily, um, I, I've been lucky enough to be there for a number of years now. Bradford University's Peace and uh, Development Studies Centre is an internationally recognised centre um, where we do um, world-leading research, but also education, training and engagement above all with communities and countries across the world. And so um, it's, for, for me, it's particularly pleasing to be facilitating this event because on our stu amongst our students and amongst our staff, uh, we're not only very diverse, but we also have um, people from maybe over 45 countries presently uh, on our courses and working uh, with us. Many of those, or some of, several of those, are asylum seekers or sanctuary or people from areas of conflict or deprivation. And uh, in peace study, so for peace studies and international development, we feel that this we're very comfortable with this sort of event. So I'd like to just set the scene before going to the panelists um, for a discussion. Um, Bradford, city of sanctuary, city of peace building. So in terms of city of sanctuary, um, of course, as Nikki was saying, and as was introduced, Bradford is extraordinarily diverse and multicultural, has been for many generations. So many people can, uh, who still have family links across the world have been living in Bradford um, for many years now. But then, of course, there are the new people, the people that have come over the last 20, 30 years from a diverse range of places, uh, for, including many war zones from Syria, from Eritrea, from Sudan, and so on. And I'm very proud that Bradford has been a place where they can make their home. Now there's a long history to this. Uh, this hasn't happened just in the last decade or two. Um, even ever since really the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which is 200 years ago or more now, Bradford's been a place where many people have wanted to come from across the world, from across the UK, of course, but also from across the world. And that's come in waves. So for example, there were very large numbers of Irish people that came over to Bradford during the early 19th century. Uh, large numbers of people from Germany, from uh, Ukraine, from Eastern Europe um, uh, came. Then after the Second World War, just to fast forward, uh, large numbers of people from Ukraine, from Eastern Germany, from Eastern Europe uh, made their home in Bradford. Um, then further forward, obviously, um, as, as most people will know, so many migrants and people welcomed from South Asia, and now more recently from, as I said, from all the way across the world. 
Now, what sort of mixture are these? Were these um, people seeking sanctuary? Um, it's a, we need to recognize here that when we talk about asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, it's always quite a complex picture. So of course, for example, some of the people I've been talking about from Ireland and from Germany and Russia, these were migrants come to make their lives better uh, because uh, Bradford at that time was a place of jobs, of um, where they could make a, a good living and so on. But just think about it. Irish coming over to Bradford during the mid-19th century, what else was going on in Ireland at the time? Jews coming from Germany, from Russia, this was at a time of pogroms against Jews and, uh, and Jews in Russia and a, a lot of Eastern Europe. What was happening in just after the Second World War in terms of migrants coming from Eastern Europe and then others coming from escaping or making their way in the world um, during the 50s and 60s. Um, it's true that many people from, uh, from South Asian background in Pakistan come from the Mirpur region. And Mirpur region, and there were many, many reasons for coming, but, it's, but the Mangla Dam, the flooding of many places where people had made their homes for generations made a big difference. And so this is not, so migration, asylum, um, escaping from periods of um, oppression, of deprivation, of conflict, these are mixed pictures. And of course that continues now. And so it's very important to bear that in mind. Now similarly, when we're talking about Bradford, a city of peace building, let's emphasize not a city of peace, but a city of peace building. <laughs> uh, Bradford's had it tough. Bradford has its problems just the same as everywhere else has its problems. If you look back to the history of Bradford in the 19th century, many of the industrial and workers disputes uh, that were taking place in the, con in, a poor, in the context of appalling industrial conditions and living conditions led to conflicts. Uh, and uh, strikes, uh, the Woolcombers strike in the early 18th century was a landmark in the development of trade unionism uh, in the UK and uh, so on. Similarly, the Independent Labour Party was established in Lister's Mill, in fact, which is not far away from us here now, um, as part of a f reflection of Bradford being at a center of struggle to try and improve people's lives and build peace uh, in a context often of adversity. Similarly, we can't deny that Bradford has its problems to do with multiculturalism. Uh, not everybody is welcoming, not everybody feels totally comfortable. We look back and we recognize 30 years ago or so uh, the riots that took place in Bradford. But what I think we can feel proud of is the fact that it's been a continual place where peace building efforts, where efforts to engage with problems, to deal and improve people's confidence with dealing in a diverse uh, um, uh, environment, for being welcoming to new uh, entrants and at the same time being inclusive for people that have already settled here and making that diverse. And I think having worked and uh, lived in and around Bradford for the last 30 years, we can see progress. Work to be done, but progress. And so uh, it's in that same context that I, from University of Bradford, Department of Peace Studies, think. Because at the Department of Peace Studies, we've had a lot of uh, programs, including those uh, that have helped with community building and so on after the Bradford riots and so on over the last 30 years. But we also engage very intensely with many of the uh, regions and countries from which people, with which people have their family links and backgrounds in Pakistan and Kashmir, in Africa, um, in Eritrea, Sudan, in Jordan. Uh, myself and Karina and Adrian who will come in later, we've been running programs recently in uh, Jordan de helping to support or hope aiming to support Syrian refugees and other diverse refugee communities. I've recently been in Sudan, um, uh, in Ethiopia, <laughs> in many of these places and so have my colleagues. So as I say, it's very important to maintain this sense that Bradford is a center of peace building and, um, and sanctuary, but also we have intense links with the rest of the world, which we aim to um, continue to develop and grow. And it's not only links in terms of support, but it's links in terms of mutual learning. Uh, so we have actively many exchanges from different people, which include not only exchanges about what the problems are, but exchanges about what the solutions can be. We can learn from each other in Bradford, we can learn from across the UK, but also, uh, for example, I myself tend to work more internationally, we can learn from the struggles to improve policing and just access to justice systems in places in Africa and Caribbean and Asia um, when it comes to Bradford and vice versa. And we've been very active in doing this. So with that, I hope that's sort of set the scene. And I'm very pleased now to um, introduce a short video. Now this is a video which is essentially a collage which we've pulled together, um, which uh, 
demonstrates, presents just a selected range of the people that have come to Bradford, made it their home from diverse areas, and those people working on the front line, um, aiming to provide support and welcome uh, to those that come for whatever reason it is, including asylum seekers and refugees. So with that, over to the video. Thank you very much. I came to England for a walk that I was told I will get visa and a walking permit and everything and that was a lie. When I got here I met a gentleman that took me to his home and actually treated me like a slave actually so I had to leave and when I went on the street I met a great family who actually took me in. I told them my story and they took me in and from there I she the lady actually went on to help me to get a GP and to introduce me to people that will help me so from there I met someone in the Salvation Army who actually brought me sent me to Bradford Bradford is more calming to me Manchester was like a prison London is too fast because where I grew up back in the Caribbean it's more quiet, peaceful. So I love Bradford because it's more, it's more like that. From the experience that I have in Hall Lane, it's like everyone that I have met there have been some sort of help in one way or the other. I feel safe here, very safe. Right now I volunteer at in churches and the joy I have from that when I pack food parcels for people and then deliver them and see the smile on the kids face or the family faces. I would like to, when I see myself, I see myself as a caregiver. So I want to be a nurse one day. So that's my future goal, to be working in the healthcare industry and to put smiling, smiles on people's faces. Because I know a smile goes a long way. No matter how sad you are, no matter how difficult something is, you meet someone and they smile at you you feel so sweet it warms your heart this is melat from bradford african community bradford african community is a newly registered charity with the aim to promote social inclusion by preventing people in particular but without limitation to african refugees and asylum seekers who are residing in this wonderful city of Bradford and Yorkshire from becoming socially excluded and assisting them to integrate into the society uh, through education training in the English language and also social and recreational facilities and events involving the local community. Our vision is to bring refugees together and asylum seekers community together and encourage and empower those granted refugee status and asylum seekers to fully participate in the society and share their mixed experiences and seek ways to establish themselves here in Bradford also and help other individuals and other community to establish themselves here in Bradford. And also we believe that Bradford deserves the title of a city of sanctuary as it is a multicultural city. It has allowed each one of us to live and work together in peace and harmony. We love Bradford, we strive in Bradford no matter where we come from. We exist to generate an environment of safety and hospitality in the city. We identify gaps in support, connect people to places, promote and host events, as well as advocate and educate for a fair, equal and diverse society. We aim to create a city that is more inclusive and welcoming, where those seeking sanctuary can enrich our city and be recognised for their contribution. I love Bradford. It's a beautiful city which has a long and rich history, built by people from all over the world. It is it's this sense of multiculturalism and diversity that helps to support this title of City of Sanctuary. The School of Sanctuary is a place that helps students, staff and the wider community understand what it means to be seeking sanctuary. It is a school of ambition. It is a school that extends a welcome to everyone, that is proud to be a place of safety and welcome for all. We work with schools across the Bradford district to support them in their work in making their schools a place of sanctuary and welcome. I'm Maggie Pierce from Bias. Biasan stands for Bradford Immigration and Asylum Support Advice Network. 
we're a refugee and asylum support organisation. We've been running now for uh, 22 years. We've never had any major funding. We rely absolutely on small grants, usually for specific purposes and our own fundraising efforts. We have never had paid staff. We have so many wonderful volunteers and that includes the refugees themselves. We cater for about ooh, 150 plus people every week in normal circumstances. We have arts and crafts sessions, theatre performances and musicians come in from time to time. For people who need it most, we deliver food to about 55 families every week. Once we're back to normal, we really do hope that people will come along themselves and just see how Biosan operates on a regular basis. Here at Refuge Action, we are a national charity supporting refugees and people seeking asylum in Bradford. We offer a range of services providing a warm welcome, access to justice, freedom from destitution and, sub and support to thrive in the community. Hi, my name is Katie Armistead and I'm team leader at Beacon. Beacon stands for Bradford Ecumenical Asylum Concern and we're a small charity based in Bradford with a big impact and a big vision that the Bradford district becomes a hospitable community where people seeking asylum and refugees are welcome, enjoy access to justice and fair treatment and are supported in their journey to independence and integration. Asylum seekers are provided with accommodation in a volunteer's home. They'll have a small allowance and support to access other services in the city as well, following a, a refusal on an asylum claim to give them a, a period of stability. There's a real focus not just on on learning English but on having fun, uh, making connections and just having the chance to be in a, a really fun and friendly and supportive environment each week and have trips to sort of parks and experience nature, places of cultural interest such as Haworth, Saltair. We support them to attend appeal hearings when they've had a refusal on a claim. We support them to access legal advice with the ultimate aim of getting some refugee status. Uh, to build their lives here in the UK. Abigail Housing is a West Yorkshire based charity providing accommodation and support to refused, destitute asylum seekers in Bradford and recently recognised refugees in Leeds. The aims of the organisation are to prevent destitution, to help people re-engage with the asylum system and to alleviate social exclusion, delivering food parcels to residents, making sure they have access to their weekly allowances and helping them to integrate into the local community. I came here to Bradford, me and my family as a refugee. Also the help of me and my family to get in the schools, college, universities. Why do I believe that Bradford deserves a title of a city of sanctuary because um, they are welcoming us here and they help us to uh, integrate in the local community. Hope Housing is a charity, housing charity in Bradford. We've been running for 12 years, designed to eliminate, eradicate homelessness. So we work with people who are on the streets and help them to find accommodation and provide some accommodation. It's secure, it's safe, it's clean. For the last 10 years or so, Bradford has been running a, a winter shelter scheme that has provided extra emergency accommodation for people over the winter period and helped them to be rehoused. When we've got people staying in there as an organisation, we can engage with and support and help those people move into something that's far more appropriate than essentially sleeping in a shed. Hello, my name is Faraha. I'm the centre manager here at the Millside Centre. We're a community centre based in the heart of Bradford, serving the needs of local people. We've been doing this for four years and we have also, over those four years, worked with a number of communities, um, particularly refugees and asylum seekers. I believe that Bradford is a city of sanctuary because uh, we are a genuinely generous city when it comes to welcoming people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, from all uh, ethnicities and creating space for them to feel like they belong. But I also think we're generous in how we receive, how we receive people's stories, how we receive their gifts, whatever they're bringing to the city. But we generally see people for who they are and give them a platform where they can connect.
Hello, I'm Carl, and I'm a trustee of Bradford Refugee Forum. As a forum, we look to support individuals, organisations and community groups of providing support with sport, with music, with art. Together, our efforts help to provide sanctuary to people, remove barriers and help with access to start a new life here in the Bradford district. Perhaps you can imagine when somebody um, arrives in a, in a new city, they don't know like um, how everything works, where to go. We find somebody uh, willing, a volunteer, uh, to help someone like that. It could be daunting for somebody maybe who's struggling with the language because what they are used to is different and they may not have, um, you know, friends and family around. We think it's really important to celebrate um, the cultures and identities of people from different refugee cultures. We aim to listen to people and work with people to run activities and projects which might involve food, music or whatever else people want to share. I support first my community, Iraqi community, to create some activities, some parties or uh, even some trips around the UK to introduce the places for the new arrivals. I'm from Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, my life was in danger with my family in Baghdad. So I met home office by Skype and they referred me to come to the UK. When I came in Bradford, I met a lot of people from different backgrounds there. Um, I heard a lot of stories and that's make me build my confidence to start my life in the UK. Also when I arrive I start like first three months to join Oxfam as a volunteer and that's helped me to build my confidence and my English language also. I like that area to be honest to help people all the time. I joined Bradford Refugee Forum and around since 2017 I'm with them. I'm now trustees in this organization. So we do a lot of work to support asylum seekers and refugees. In uh, refugee weeks I do DJ uh, every year for the people and we enjoy the life there. Hello, my name is Rosie McPherson and I'm the Artistic Director of Standard Recounted Theatre Company. We're based at Theatre in the Mill in Bradford and we're very proud to be the UK's first theatre company of Sanctuary. What this means is that all of the work that we make is made with and for asylum seekers, refugees and migrants new to the UK. We're a campaigning theatre company, so we'll take work across the country that is co-created and led by communities and individuals who have lived experience of the themes that we're presenting. We've made computer games, we've made documentaries, we've made audio adventures. We're always exploring lots of different creative ways that we can make sure that everybody has heard that this is a platform to give people a voice to make sure that their stories and their experiences are understood and told from their mouths. We run training programs throughout the year, creative skills for employment to support people to find the next steps in their employment ladder. We run creative activism and leadership training for sanctuary seekers who are interested in taking roles on boards or as trustees, being in those rooms, making those decisions that affect their day-to-day -day lives. If you would like to take part in any of our workshops or you've got an idea for what our next creative project might be. Please do get in touch. Our doors are always open. Um, the first time I came to Bradford, it was when I was a volunteer at the Refugee Council. Next time I came to Bradford was when I came for the interview, um, hoping to become a social worker. Fortunately, I did get the, the chance to study as a social worker in Bradford. I used to regard myself as nobody because I didn't have anything. When I say I didn't have anything, I had lost everything, including my only son I had, which made me to feel like there was no need for me to be alive. But when I came here through the sanctuary scholarship, I felt like a human being again. I thought I would help somebody. My aim was to help somebody, even if it's a one person or a one child, especially me being an asylum seeker for a long time, which it took 12 years and two months before I could get some kind of status. And the second time, what brought me to Bradford, I came as a performer. Can you imagine? For me, it was a joy knowing that people are coming to watch me. The only thing it was in my heart was that I want to help 
people who are in the situation that I used to be in. When you've been an asylum seeker for a long time, by the time um, you get your status, if you are lucky, you are already exhausted. You don't see any future in your life. But for me, at my age, to do the things that I did, it felt like if I could do it, other people can do it without uh, those lovely people who saw something in me, I wouldn't be here. So they sort of made me again. What an inspiring video and it's very inspiring always to hear about the people that have come uh, from so many different uh, uh, places but also under so many positions of adversity and then made their lives in Bradford and elsewhere and then wanting to give a lot back and similarly it's fantastic to see all of the networks of volunteers. Uh, it's a very important point that there's uh, around in and around Bradford there's a whole network of NGOs and centres and initiatives that are taking place and although and in practice they all depend on volunteers. There are a very few full-time people but in, uh, but in general and it's so wonderful that people from every different, uh, different community in Bradford is contributing to that. So with that, now we enter into a two-phase process of discussion. And so in a little while, we'll be asking you who are participating to ask questions to a panel, which I'll introduce in a second. But before that, um, uh, we'll just have a quick panel discussion to respond and elaborate on some of the themes that might have emerged from that video and from the broad theme of uh, Bradford City of Sanctuary and Peace Building. So I'm pleased, very pleased to welcome in the studio here three panelists. Uh, so there's Mo Rahman from from uh, Bayasan, uh, there's Hannah Butterfield from Stand and Be Counted Theatre and Will Sutcliffe uh, from the Bradford City of Sanctuary. So before we start with any questions, uh, let me just hand over briefly to each of you so you can introduce yourselves a tiny little bit more. So Mo. Uh, my name is Musrat Rahman, I'm a long-standing Bayasan volunteer. Uh, we've been running lots of different types of activities at Bayasan including arts and crafts, day trips, residentials and recently some training courses. Thanks a lot. Will? So hi, yes, Will Sutcliffe. I chair Bradford City Sanctuary Group. And we were established about 12 years ago when the, the national movement was still very small and largely Yorkshire based. And now it's, it's right across the whole of the UK. There's 120 plus groups, which is wonderful. And our work, our energy is put into creating a place of welcome, hospitality, inclusion, trying to influence every sector of the community, of the city, to open the doors, to open hearts, and to provide opportunities for people who have sought sanctuary here to participate and to thrive. Thanks very much, and Hannah. Hello, I'm Hannah Butterfield. I'm Associate Director at Stand and Be Counted Theatre, um, and we are proudly the UK's first theatre company of sanctuary. Um, we've been running for about 10 years now. That's great, thanks very much. Well look, I mean, I think it's wise to start with uh, a sort of open question. So it's very clear that we've got a great deal to be proud of in Bradford in terms of um, as it, in what's been done. But you know, how are we doing overall? Because obviously we're meeting these challenges, but they're, they're big challenges, <laughs> and what more can be done? I just wonder whether you could have any opening thoughts about that. Mo? I feel like we have done a lot of um, approaching these issues basically. We do know that when communities come into Bradford from the asylum seeker communities that they do have trauma and they do have their mental and emotional problems but we have gone out of our way to in I know that there's a lot of organisations that are doing this that to make them feel at home at comfortable we try to re-educate them and re-establish them into the UK's way of living and trying to rehumanize them is the right way and from that once they become more healed and ready and able to step out of that zone we know that they want jobs they want to be in comfortable houses they want to basically get into training they want to get into education I've, and set up businesses so i feel as though we need to try and provide as much opportunity as possible on these lines for, so people can go out and show the diversity of their culture and their communities and how they live 
and that way it's sort of bridging into the UK life as well. And it, it, we and Bradford, we are such a welcoming community, but we're such a rich, we have such a rich diversity, which is culturally and community has changed over the last 10 years. But I just feel there's not enough opportunities for people to be on every corner right now. And we should have all these communities setting up little hubs because they're so talented. We do, people forget that they had their own lives back in their own countries before they arrived in the UK and they were skilled in, as tailors, as shopkeepers, as running so many different types of businesses. So we need to provide those opportunities again. Thanks very much. And Will, how are we doing? Um, I, I'm always trumpeting Bradford as a city sanctuary and the wonderful things that have been achieved in the city. And we're sitting here in the university, which is one of the country's first universities of sanctuary, offering sanctuary scholarships to asylum seekers and refugees. And this year the offer has been considerably improved. So that's wonderful. Um, many of the challenges we face are really imposed from outside of a city, sadly, from central government. And the, that, that whole context is about to come considerably worse with the new immigration plan. Um, but as Mo said, it's, it's, it, the, I think the, what I find most difficult is seeing people with immense skills and experience um, rotting for years while they wait for a decision on their asylum claim and then unable to get back into employment or at the very least into a suitable employment. Um, I'm old enough to remember when people used to talk about the brain drain in the UK, about all our best brains leaving the country. Well, we've got a brain gain here. We've got some of the very best brains coming from other countries ha having been forced to flee because of appalling circumstances. And we have a resource which is remaining untapped. Meanwhile, people through enforced inactivity uh, deteriorate, their mental health deteriorates, and they, 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 their life evaporates. It's been wonderful to watch the video just now and seeing people like Emily, who's fought for 12 years to get leave to remain and now is really grasping the opportunities and moving forward. But we long for more opportunities, um, the, you know, for employers to recognise the resource that there are, are, is in um, the refugee community, to see the potential. People who have endured things that I won't hope I never face in my worst nightmare, they, quite apart from the, the, the trauma, but they gained immense skills and resourcefulness and resilience in that terrible journey and these are skills which can really be put to use in our community and in our country. Thanks very much and Hannah how are we doing? Yeah I want to pick up on something that um, came up in the film uh, from both Gazwan and Emily about the need to um, to be supported in, in, in regaining confidence um, and that's where um, our work as a theatre company of Sanctuary has been um, we've been actively working with people um, but now a few years later I feel like um, we're constantly, there are lots of amazing organisations doing amazing work and some of that you can see in the film. Um, but I think that a lot of the time we're just responding to decisions that are made by central government and trying to kind of um, deal with the, the people on an individual basis and we're always kind of catching up or always chasing our tail. So what we are thinking about a lot and talking about a lot, um, not just our organisation but other organisations and we're kind of growing in numbers, um, is about trying to... Um, trying to inform some of those decisions before they're made rather than responding to them. So really campaigning for some of those big decisions to be made and using theatre as a platform and a training opportunity to get people um, with experience of going through these processes and these systems to, to really explain where things might not be right and where they should be. No, well, thanks very much. And you're absolutely right that, obviously, as I said, peace building is a process of struggle, not just, uh, not just being good and welcoming, but actually supporting people in their struggles. And I think that's, that's come through. Can I just ask you to elaborate a little bit? Because obviously, as you say, many people come having experienced trauma um, in their home or even uh, and the process of getting to the UK also. And so there's a long uh, recovery period. And in that context, one can see that it's fantastic having welcoming NGOs, but also having a diverse community into which you can find people maybe who have of similar experience. But one of the challenges that I've seen in other cities has been quite the, the risk that people sort of enter their own little niche, you know, the Syrian refugee, the Eritrean refugee, the, uh, the Caribbean. Can you, um, I wonder whether any of you have got anything to say about um, how we've been able to overcome that? 
Mm. Well, what we did at Biosan, we did find that people were going into the little clicks. So we started moving tables around and started sh uh, shifting things around. And uh, quite a lot of volunteers were doing this. So we'd get different refugees from different nationalities sitting together and we'd spark up conversations with them. And, but what people need to understand is at the back of this, back of this why people were sitting in their groups because they were frightened and afraid a little bit so you had to build it wasn't just about um sticking her in these little trying to break up the groups you had they had to trust you trust you enough to let you into their circle and that was the only way we were going to be able to break up these little diversities and make them all sit together and mingle and we've managed to do this quite regularly at Biosan and we 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 now have everybody sitting together from different nationalities and, and cooking together and explaining different things for other people. So it's, it works that way. As long as they trust you and you know they're not going to take their information and sell it or you know, just using them, they will trust you and that will be fine. Yes, Will, Good do you have go. anything to add on that? Thank you. It's a very natural thing, isn't it? Brits abroad tend to um, congregate in their own um, comfortable tea drinking communities. Um, and yeah, th there are strengths in that inevitably, but certainly there's massive losses to the city and to people individually. And so much of the time it's, it's, it's partly based on ignorance about what's out there. I mean, we've been very involved recently in developing a website called Welcome to Bradford. If you just look up welcomebradford.org, which is uh, it, translatable information and a vast range of, 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 of different um, topics uh, around for people newly arriving in the city about the whole wealth of information um, and resources and, and services that are out there. So just the information po poverty is, is one of the issues that forces people inevitably to seek out their own community and others who speak the language. English language classes, there's, 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 there's it, it, um, asylum seekers are not entitled to ESOL provision until they've been here at least six months and then uh, 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 it, it can be partial after that. We, have a, we passionately believe about the importance in, of getting people involved in volunteering and promote, we've, welcome to, uh, we've got volunteering information sessions to get people out to recognise um, that so often helping themselves, they are you know, helping others is, is helping themselves and opportunities to mix with and meet with and work alongside people from very different backgrounds and cultures. There's a, there's a very long answer to that, but I, that's probably <laughs> uh, just scratched the surface. No, thank you very much. And Hannah, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think the language is a really complex and um, difficult issue. Um, that I think people are a bit afraid of a lot of the time um, but we spend a lot of time in our sessions so we're running a programme at the moment which is about um, creativity and well-being um, and we try and enjoy the process of being lost in, in translation <laughs> those kinds of um, difficult places where we're not quite sure what we mean or we're coming at things from a different perspective and trying to make that a, a more comfortable place to be um, because once you spend more time in it, it, it doesn't feel so uncomfortable anymore. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's right. And I mean, as you said, Will, earlier, that, um, uh, you know, this, this frustrate, the frustrating limits on legal employment <laughs> and therefore yeah. really bringing through, I mean, one of the characteristics of there are obviously grey and black economies, but uh, those are typically low skilled and are not bringing the best to the community in so many different ways. Uh, I wonder whether you can, once, once those legal constraints are, uh, are off, as it were, I wonder whether any of you got any sort of sense of um, how people uh, have started anew in terms of those careers. We heard some interesting experiences there with somebody saying, was it uh, Emily saying, uh, a performer, that was the next time I came to Bradford, me, you know, I never imagined it, and now I'm a social mm -hmm. worker and so on. So obviously everybody in the world nowadays is uh, pursuing careers that go through strange, uh, you know, um, through exciting but not necessarily yeah. predictable trajectories. I don't know whether any of you have got any comments on that or things that we could do a little bit more to help to sponsor. Of course, the university is mm -hmm. seeking to play its role in this Absolutely. by bringing yeah. skills, and that's one of the key areas in which we can contribute, of course. But um, We no. found that we've, uh, through, through bias and with some of the people we've met, have ended up, um, we found that in their own home countries, they used to run businesses. And then when they've ended up in the UK, obviously sort of stuck in the system, and they've been very keen to get up and start redeveloping the skills and setting up little businesses. So that's been something we've been pursuing, like as social enterprises. And quite a few people have gone on to set up as barbers, um, seamstresses, and arts and crafts um, activities like that. So that's been, and cooking has been one way of people have been finding ways to go into businesses, which has been great. 
Mm. No, that's true. I mean, I'll come to you in a moment, Amanda, but I referred earlier to the work by myself uh, with my colleagues Adrian and Karina, and um, we've been working with refugee and diverse t communities in complex contexts in uh, very close to the war zones. Uh, but being able to swap on uh, actual cultural heritage between divided groups yes. so that people can learn each other's cooking, what have you. It's amazing. For example, in the northern Jordan, a lot of the Syrian refugees assumed that Syria was Syria was Syria, but in fact it's loads of microcultures and people learning about the different ways of having weddings and cooking and all of that was not only important in its own right, but it helped build confidence in terms of solidarity in the community. Um, mm. Hannah. Mm. Yeah, I remember very clearly the moment when we first met Emily and we were um, making a show called Tanya, which was about immigration detention centres. And Emily did have, um, as she would word it, no experience in performing, but she had tons of experience in performing because she was really skilled at public speaking because of lots of opportunities with volunteering with organisations like City of Sanctuary. Um, so she was very comfortable in addressing groups of people and talking about her experiences because of her desire to support the next people, the next generation, the next um, people who were seeking support that she, she, was, she had, had benefited from. Um, and she was also a really gifted singer and would sing all this beautiful music. So for us, it didn't seem like a stretch at all to um, invite her to, to perform. And she ended up doing two national tours of that show effortless, effortlessly. <laughs> <laughs> well, about this idea of people sort of, there's sort of examples of how people have contributed and built uh, you know, new careers and all of that, anything that you can Yeah, I mean, I'd love to, to, I mean, there are examples, but not as many as, as there should be. Um, again, there's an, there's an ignorance of support that's out there. So um, we've recently run a webinar uh, putting people, uh, frontline organisations in Bradford, in touch with national organisations, which are, and local as, and regional rather, who are helping refugees into employment. Because there's helping them both um, negotiate the, you know, the, the, just the practicalities of CV writing, but also helping people to get their qualifications revalidated um, mm -hmm. or uh, with the funding to 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 to, to to complete some further study to, to be able to retain or to climb back to the positions they held before. Mm -hmm. So, it, yes, there's, there's a lot of ignorance about the help that is out there, and that, that's quite sad to us here because it, it, there's good projects which are probably sitting there twiddling their thumbs while there's people out here, people here who are, who are desperate for work. So there are good, there's good work going on in Bradford, but certainly much more linking up that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks very much. I mean, one of the things that I've been very aware of is, of course, we all bring our own international links. Yeah. And if you've come from a war zone or a disaster zone or something like that, it's not only the question of making your own life in Bradford, but it's the anxieties to do with your family, the links, uh, so many different issues. I, and, um, and so being acknowledged of that, that's a strength in a way, because obviously in this globalised world, the more linked a community, a city is, the more it can advance, the more it can understand what's going on, take opportunities in various ways. But it can also, particularly when you're dealing with people that have come from war zones or from disaster zones and so on, where there's continuing problems, be a challenge. I don't know whether you have anything to say about the, you know, facilitating these links. Obviously, people I know, they'll be obviously constantly in, uh, in contact with their family back home or whatever it might be. But, um, but that can be a source of strength in terms of being able to talk to them so easily, but also uh, a source of extra challenge. I guess there's also the issue of being able to send money back home, which um, even with re within relatively p impoverished communities here, I know that some of them really make an effort to try and send money back home in order to support their families back, uh, back from where they've come from. Do, Mo, have you found this? We find that certain groups will set up their own support groups about networks, um, like the Syrian community, the African communities, they'll have their own little groups together. And they start organising between themselves, like fundraising and also keeping everybody in the loop as well. I think that is good for us to know that they have places to go externally outside of the like traditional like Biasan and Refugee Forum and all those places because you need that support within your own community. Uh, we do see this quite regularly happening. Um, that's all I can think of right now, to be honest. Mm. No, that's great. Um, Hannah? Mm, yeah, I think um, it can just be such a struggle. We hear people time and time again reporting about the, the, the systems in place that, fe that feel like they're putting up barriers for people to, and, and we hear this term integration all the time and there's a lot of issues with a term like that, it's a really difficult term, um, because of course it's very difficult to 
find yourself um, doing the things that you maybe were doing in your life before when you've been through such a traumatic series of circumstances. And I think um, there needs to be more um, support and more focus on those kind of uh, more general well-being needs and those um, issues of kind of developing self-confidence because even if you've learned some English, you know, trying to learn a new language when you're dealing with all of these things is, is, is a kind of impossible task for lots of people. Whereas learning English in a different way perhaps in a way that's a bit more um, experiential or a bit more um, considered in its approach. Um, it's these small things, I, th I think, that I've seen make quite a big difference in certain areas for certain people. Yeah, Will? It's two levels, really. On a very basic level, asylum seekers, whilst they're in the asylum system, are living on under £6 a day. Mm. Now, to be able to afford a mobile phone and the data to maintain contact with family abroad uh, in, in, in the home countries and elsewhere. Of course, their families may not be in home countries. They may have dispersed like they did, and uh, not and like them, not necessarily know which country they're going to. So th there's that issue in, in itself, just a very practical one of being able to afford and have the, yeah, the data, the phone, to be able to make contact. Of course, as I'm, I've just referred to, many people have been separated from and have no means of contacting their family. So there's excellent projects like the Refugee, um, sorry, Red Cross, British Red Cross Family Reunion Service, um, which helps not just bring people back together, but also identify where in the world, through their incredible networks, where people are. So there's been some incredibly heart-moving stories of people who have completely lost touch with family members who thought they were dead, being able to be re re reconciled. I think the other thing is, for us who are working in this sector and for those who are working amongst and with and, and employing people from refugee backgrounds, is just to recognise the ongoing trauma that people are experiencing. Everybody in, in our, you know, our enlightened society, we recognise that uh, uh, people are, are whole, uh, 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 employers recognise their employees are whole people and therefore are likely to be impacted by family breakdowns, family illness, whatever, and make allowances for that. I, I'm not sure we've fully understood the impacts of, um, or, or, of, of what people are experiencing, what well, their family members are experiencing back home of the ongoing conflicts and the impact of those conflicts on them. And I think that's a long learning um, journey for us all, really. Thanks very much. I mean, at this point, I'd like to bring in a question that um, uh, another panelist, uh, another participant has asked us, Karina, Karina Croucher, and that's, um, she asks, I wonder what Bradford could do to change its negative image? Uh, because if you go um, to certain parts of the UK, as it were, it's, um, you know, the, the Bradford is seen as a place which isn't as creative and diverse and as, uh, you know, uh, as exciting as, um, as we've, we know it to be. Um, so, do you have any sort of ideas about this? I, I must say that uh, sitting in the Department of Peace Studies, we find it fascinating. We're um, a number one place to go to for international students, all of whom who know about uh, Bradford and our own centre, which is uh, very flattering. And so, in that sense, it's fine. But when you're dealing with home students, uh, you know, maybe coming to a, an undergraduate, there's no doubt that this sort of sense that maybe the city is, uh, is a little bit less comfortable than other cities. I wonder whether you have any thoughts about the image issue? Well I think that Bradford always gets a bashing and I think Bradford gets a bashing by uh, people outside of Bradford and I don't appreciate that. I think people can't understand. I think why we get bashed now is because over the last 10 years Bradford has massively changed in culturally, economically, socially. We, are, we, could, we could definitely rival Leeds and we could definitely rival London so we'll give you a heads up now London. But I feel as though we, we have got a massive, rich, un, untapped um, melting pot of culture and creativity that we could tap into. I feel, as though, I feel as though we need to provide more opportunities for this to be seen. We've got a, a city centre full of shops that we can totally populate with like exhibitions and cultural things. And we could do little pop-up stalls. I'm just running things off of my head how I feel as though we could do stuff. We could take it out into the communities and put these little cultural activities on just to show people the rich heritage and culture that is the underpins Bradford and the fact that we have now got additional culture and heritage that have been brought in by other nationalities. I feel as though we're just giving everybody a run for their money and, I've and I know the central government can't hear me, but can you pass some more money this way, please, <laughs> so we can put all this into place? Yeah, I'll send them <laughs> an email later. Uh, uh, Will, any thoughts on this question? Yeah, I, I possibly have a slightly, um, what's the opposite of jaded, rose-tinted perspective. I mean, I moved here 
17 years ago, having lived in various parts of the country, mo mostly down south. And I think that it's, it's too well a kept secret. I think this is a wonderful city. I, it, we, you know, we arrived here, we're just bowled over by the energy, the vibrancy, the, the creativity. Um, and certainly within the Refugee and Asylum Support Network and nationally in City Sanctuary, mm -hmm. Bradford is recognised as being right up there and, and very, very well respected. So how do we get that message out? That, that is the challenge. Um, yeah, sadly, I think too often we're measured on the things which actually don't, I mean, many things clearly do count, but so often we're measured on, on indices that don't necessarily count. I, I remember, I, I still keep a copy of it, sadly, in, my, in a work folder, how Bradford was um, rated in a, a Daily Telegraph, published an article back in about 2010, how the value of, a, 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 on an index of good neighbourliness, they reckoned Bradford came out first in the whole of the UK and that added £3,000 in value of house. With well, things like that, pieces of research like that, I, that should have been, I, there should have been banners over City Hall when that piece of research was carried out by the Lloyd's TSB Foundation. Um, I never heard anything mentioned about it in Bradford. Mm -hmm. and I do wonder if we, perhaps we aren't as good at telling and trumpeting the good news and the, the very mm -hmm. many good stories. You know, I'm fortunate to live in a very multi, a very diverse community. We have wonderful neighbours. I'm quite looking forward to eat because we'll eat extremely well. Um, <laughs> but we eat well all year round because our neighbours are constantly knocking on the door and bringing us meals. There's mm. so many things which we can shout about in Bradford, mm. um, not least the magnificent countryside all around us. Yes, mm. Hannah, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, we, we're a touring theatre company, so we're, we travel around a lot. Um, but making our home in Bradford was a really deliberate decision. So we're based now permanently at Theatre in the Mill. Um, so we made that decision because we spend a lot of time going here, there and everywhere, sometimes um, working internationally and sometimes touring work nationally. So um, to come home here, I think is really important to us um, and to have a base here um, has been something that we really want to do. And I, th I think it is, that, it is that experience of if you, if you come back, because my family were from Bradford originally and then I went away and then I've come back and there's lots of stories like mine where people have gone away and come back. Um, so I think it's just bringing people in. So I think as many opportunities as possible, festivals are a great way of doing that. So bringing people into the city and then people go, oh, this Bradford's got a lot going for it. Yeah, <laughs> By well, certainly it. we've been doing pretty well on the festivals in my experience. <laughs> so, so I think we've now, I mean, thank you very much and we'll continue with this and I'll invite you, but let's just see if the audience and the participants has um, uh, some more questions. So I um, am uh, just looking to, uh, to check whether there are any coming along. Um, I, I'm reliant on. Um, that's, I've already got that one. I've already asked that one. <laughs> okay, so we'll just uh, so that we'll I'll just wait for some of those to come through a little bit more. So I wonder whether you can think about uh, can comment a little bit to do with uh, COVID and the COVID context. I mean, obviously we're now hopefully. Uh, in a slight relaxation, but the, the new normal that everybody talks about is going to be a very complex, funny thing, and I don't know whether that's a, a, the quite way of framing it. Um, but I just wonder, do you think um, we've come out, uh, from your experience, we've come out of the experience um, of COVID in a situation to move forward rapidly, or is there an awful lot of, not in terms of social interaction, obviously we'll continue to obey all of the uh, relevant health guidelines and all of that, but just in mm -hmm. terms of uh, bounce back in terms of integration, in terms of community resilience and all of those issues. Um, well, um, I think you know, the, the, the it, everybody's recognised the impact of isolation on mental health of, the, of communities around the world, but in, you know, obviously most locally in the UK. Um, and that's for people who are settled here, have families, have the means of communicating and probably have the means of getting out and know their community and have some money. Um, for people who are in the asylum process, and even worse, those who are destitute and who are, uh, 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 f uh, have no recourse to public funds and are fighting to, to re-establish re their asylum claims, the, I, um, I'm, what worries me is I don't think we know adequately, by asylum are doing magnificent work getting food parcels out and visiting people, but we're, we're probably only scratching the surface. There are very, very significant numbers of people in the city who have arrived here in the last 12, 18 months or had come you know, shortly before that, who haven't been going out to buy sand, to Beacon, yeah. to all the other won wonderful services which are, are normally running. And uh, the, you know, I think the, the, the impact of, of, their, of the mental health problems developing there will take some time to be felt. Yeah. 
So I think it's very early to be to be making any any sort of prognoses really. Mm. Um, it's 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 hard to tell. I I you know. Yes, I I, I really I'm not sure I know the answer. Mm. Anybody else? Can I, you? I think. Um, the the discussions around are there things of how things were before that we don't want to return to and i've been trying really hard over the last 12 months or so to to hold on to that a little bit are there things that that we don't want to go back to the old ways of doing things and what has what opportunities has this difficult year afforded us actually in terms of um a bit of space and time to reflect and not just constantly um you know, churning out new, um, the way that we've always done it, a, a, an opportunity to really reflect on how we do things, um, which is easier said than done, of course. Um, but I think that um, c making connections with people online, we've certainly all skilled up, I think, a lot of us. <laughs> um, and in the beginning, hearing people say, well, that won't be possible. It won't be possible for you to carry on those sessions with um, sanctuary seekers online and and a year later we're, we're still doing it so mm -hmm. I think there's there's a lot to be said for some of those skills that we've all developed through this this year mm -hmm. absolutely Mary, any thoughts? well what we try to do uh, to keep our groups occupied we tried providing craft packs and we got lots of um, because we normally used to take our groups out into the Yorkshire Dales as a great way to relieve stress but we couldn't do that anymore so they provided with loads of craft packs and we set up groups online I hope, in a sense, I don't really want to go back to the busyness of the life that we used to have before. <laughs> if I don't, I don't because I feel like it, it took away some of the quality of the things we, we could do and can do, I suppose, you know. I think it's made me really think about not doing those things, churning things out, definitely, but trying to spend more time developing projects that have a, that I can see an outcome with properly, you know what I mean? Mm. That's, there's something there on a longer scale. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, I can see that. I mean, at, as, as one of you mentioned earlier, festivals, I think one of the things we need is to think about imaginative ways of re resurrecting festivals over the next year <laughs> about some of these yeah. things. And uh, that's, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, of course, that not necessarily massive things in which everybody gets together, but, um, but it's some, uh, some way of easing in. I think that would be, that'd be very good. Another thing that um, seems to me to be very important is that. Um, you know, one of the areas of specialism in, um, in my own department and in, in the university in research is about community and community resilience building overseas. And in a sense, I often feel that there's quite a segmentation between the experience that you, that people that are working overseas an awful lot, you know, trying to assist in post-conflict uh, reconciliation or whatever it might be, are often not exchanging lessons learned adequately and sufficiently intensely uh, with uh, lessons learned from you know similar communities, obviously in a different context. This yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, thank heavens, UK is a relatively secure, <laughs> good context to be in. But nevertheless, an awful lot of the sort of micro lessons could be exchanged yeah. a lot. And so one of the things that uh, you know I've been involved in a little bit is exchanges just between you know Bradford and other cities. Um, sometimes cities, uh, my colleagues also in uh, you know in Rio de Janeiro, in Lagos, in you know, and uh, so many different areas where those can work. I don't know whether you think that um, there's more that could be done in that area and if so whether you have any reflections um, it, it, for example there may be you know there are international networks of refugee and asylum international NGOs that are working on trying to learn the lessons mm -hmm. of doing this sort of thing in Sudan uh, that maybe mm -hmm. you know we could get the, the distinction between local activism and international mm -hmm. activism can sometimes we could do something more to breach that I don't know what you think about that I think that would be great, me. I'd love to see more opportunities developed between local communities and national agencies because obviously it's such a big thing for uh, a person to have left their country and arrive into another country and set up their home. And those experiences will be really valuable. Um, all the experiences they've ex taken on board to do an exchange about life, living, and how to make things work. I don't mm. know, that's what's in my head, you know, like exploring those avenues, how you can educate people, how it feels from that perspective to then arrive at this this end. Mm, and Hannah, I mean, I'm, I'm aware, although I'm not a professional in the theatre business at all, just how internationally networked mm. theatre companies like yourself will be. And yeah. I just wonder whether you have any reflections. No. 
I think it depends on the specific kind of practice. We, we know, we're well connected with other organisations who are doing really incredible work on an international scale um, and bringing that work back. And one of the things that's been really exciting in the last couple of years is the Theatres of Sanctuary network, which is growing. Um, so these are kind of cultural organisations, big theatres and smaller organisations like us um, coming together um, as regularly as possible. There's actually an event happening today. Um, as we speak, there's a Theatres of Sanctuary Network assembly happening. Um, and through that, people have sort of worked out who was doing what kind of practices and who was working where, and then have formed sort of different subgroups so that we can share good practice. And that's been something that's been really significant. And I think it's those connections that are going to have legacy. Mm, thanks. Will, any thoughts? Yes, it's a big one, isn't it? I think we, we, we tend to work in a slight bunker mentality. We're, most of us are in tiny little organisations with very few staff. And, and to a certain extent, just to get our, um, our heads around the local context, let alone the national, let alone the international context, is probably um, a challenge that we've not, not adequately taken on. I can just think of somebody who came as a refugee to Bradford from the DR, from DR Congo, who is back working there now in conflict resolution and thinking, wow, we could certainly benefit hugely from, from the, the, the learning which he's, he's developing and mm -hmm. the work that he's doing, um, just as I'm sure he's taken some of the lessons that he learned in, in, during his time in Bradford. No, that's right, great. So Nafessa asks um, a, a really interesting question. It relates to, you know, if other cities and universities uh, uh, want, to, uh, you know, are interested in this idea of City of Sanctuary and, uh, you know, following some of the, you know, learning from some of the lessons in Bradford, I wonder what, um, you know, what sort of lessons or if you could each draw one or two big lessons as to what might be the biggest opportunity, what are the things that you need to do first, what, what to concentrate on. Um, uh, uh, Hannah, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, c I can't speak for a whole city of sanctuary for no. sure, but um, in the Theatres of Sanctuary network, I think the really important thing is that um, it's a long-term commitment. It's not just something that can be um, dealt with in a project. So we talk a lot about the sustainability of that and we are um, project by project funded. So trying to kind of maintain that is really important to us um, and making sure that we are a place of welcome wherever we are because we're not just fixed in one place. I think that's mm. a really important point um, to consider that it has to be a long-term commitment. Yeah, thanks. Will? Um, so many aspects of the work of City Sanctuary are, are growing rapidly and one of the, the latest uh, developments is the local authorities network. So um, there's a number of local authorities across the country who are coming together and uh, uh, as to, to, to support one another but also to help campaign and raise awareness um, within central government. So I would suggest any, any local authority, anybody who's got links with local authority, which is, is still further back in the journey, to contact the national movement and to encourage them to join that network. It's a very open discussion taking place there. Um, and certainly for universities, you know, th there is a, um, a, a wonderful national universities of sanctuary movement as a coordinator nationally doing some very good work and she attended a meeting online uh, in, uh, with Bradford Group recently. A lot of information, a lot of resources out there, there's no need to reinvent wheels. A lot of work has been done and a lot of support available. Um, and the lovely thing about the, the, the movement is it's a very open, very, uh, there's, there's, there's no, never encountered anywhere a, a, a desire for anybody to, to, to hold things to themselves. It's a very open, generous mo movement. To w there's a, Everybody wants and is happy to share their experiences, as well as all the sort of practical stuff about how to get funding, how to um, yeah, just to develop policies, procedures, and all that sort of mm. legal stuff, which is important, but uh, not so exciting. Thanks, Mo. Any other thoughts? No, I think that just went straight out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no trouble. Faraha um, asks uh, an interesting question, which uh, asks to go a little bit deeper about this question of how to, um, uh, how to ensure, as you say, integration isn't quite, but let's use the word integration, but we understand you know, how to br break down barriers between new arrivals and host communities, those host communities being the communities that look back, mm -hmm. even if they've arrived in Bradford you know generations ago they now see themselves as settled and uh, and then as new arrivals huh? because obviously it can be easier to um, break down the barriers between different groups that come in all of whom have arrived at the s a similar time to mm -hmm. the compared with the host communities I wonder whether you have any 
thoughts, good examples, um, priorities that you'd like to highlight, Mo? I think we have tried quite a lot to, uh, into when new people have arrived and uh, doing exchanges between communities, we've tried to take them around, what we've tried to do is go through the schools networks, we've gone through different communities, taken them around, we did a project called Art of Conversations and we worked with, we took sort of Rough Gina Samsi uh, from our community and we took them around all the different districts of Bradford and we sat there and introduced them to so many different areas of Bradford and there's took them into the community centres and we just sat there and exchanges, conversations and food, So, and that's all we did to build bridges with different communities. And I feel as though maybe that's just one way to do it as well. Mm. Yes. Mm. Hannah? Yeah, I think any opportunity to welcome everybody into those spaces, it's not just about welcome for the people who are seeking sanctuary, it's about welcome for everyone. So mm. any opportunity to bring various communities together for some kind of conversation is, is really important. And that's something that um, you can do in the theatre, of course, in, in ways that are easy to imagine, but also a lot of the work that these amazing organisations are doing, it, it's really not very visible because it's mm. happening in your local community centre or it's happening um, maybe not somewhere that you would see it. So I think um, maybe there are some questions to be raised about the visibility of these, mm. um, these groups and these organisations who are doing such brilliant work and, mm. and making space for other people to be part of that or maybe seeking That's new right. volunteers, that mm. kind of thing. Mm. Oh, on that note, sorry for interrupting Will, we definitely need new volunteers. We'd mm. like, we definitely would like to encourage more people to volunteer at the, these organisations. Biosan definitely needs some more volunteers. Definitely interested in younger people volunteering and staying. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, again, there's no simple answers there, are there? Um, we, working together, celebrating together, um, volunteering together, getting people to, to mix uh, and, and have opportunities to mingle is, is, is a, an element of that. We had, for a number of years, a wonderful Bradford mailer. Uh, we held a sanctuary tent there, mm. which was right in the, in the midst of a festival. Uh, ignorance prejudice breeds on, well, uh, on, on, on people never meeting, never encountering the other. The more opportunities we have for people to encounter the other, people from uh, refugee communities meeting each other, but the, the, uh, the blending and mingling in the wider community, the better. Refugee Week um, will be online again this year, sadly, again, middle of June, week commencing 14th. There'll be a number of activities. Sadly, there won't be those mixing and mingling opportunities. But that, that's those sort of things are things that we as City Sanctuary have been involved in over the years. But really getting people to, um, to be able to you know, particularly volunteer and work together um, is, is a part of that. This, it needs something on a far more organised level. And I know what Farah is getting at, and it's more than just people um, eating together at, a, at, a, at an event. But um, that's probably a, a, a a, a question for, for Owen to go into in more depth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it is a challenge. I mean, obviously it's a challenge, but I think the key is just to assume that, just to recognise that um, uh, breaking down barriers, you know, that all ca communities are extremely diverse, and just if you're successful breaking down some barriers or building some mm -hmm. links, yeah. uh, one always needs to keep an eye on those that are not participating. Mm -hmm. And I think this relates to a uh, question that Jonathan's uh, raised, which is, um, in a sense, um, as I, I mean, his question is, we're clearly all on the same length, uh, wavelength here, but how do we get the message to the broader public? And um, that's, uh, so I'd be very interested in your responses there, but let me um, see if one, um, one aspect of that is, you know, um, uh, that in a set that these sort of networks can be self-contained. All of those people that are interested and engaged with that mutually support. Those people that feel uh, nervous of them or hostile to them yeah. um, can, uh, you know, don't necessarily engage and therefore those messages come out. And of course this is complicated. You get a message out, but we all know, I mean social scientists know, that the way people are persuaded is when people they know who they trust tell them something. So mm -hmm. it's about social networks as much as it is about messaging at a corporate level or at, a, at a, any other sort of level. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so this question, I mean, so for example, in Bradford, I used to uh, live in an area where, um, it, where or close to an area where there was um, essentially a white working class enclave that felt very, very alienated from a lot of things, <laughs> including you know the rest of you know the rest of the UK, as it were, sort of feeling unsupported. And I suppose that has been a challenge in a number of the northern post-industrial cities uh, that those sorts of groups 
exist alongside obviously many, many other groups, but they're, but they're a significant group. And uh, sometimes the word multiculturalism seems like a threat uh, uh, in those sorts of uh, contexts. I don't know whether you've had any, um, I mean, in my experience, those communities, uh, there's often very many entry points. But the question is, as you said, Will, you need to focus on them and actually exploit them mm -hmm. and think very hard about how to engage with, um, uh, you know, with those people that feel, you know, nervous of that sort of engagement or potentially hostile. I don't know whether you could. I'm, in, when I look back now and I look at the work we've done with Biosan, we have tried, our, we try as hard as we can to break down as many barriers as possible and misinformation that people are being fed by the media, by the TV, by, by rumours that have been spread by what people have heard and misconstrued. I've heard it time and time again from people in, on my street, in my neighbourhood, and I've sat there and said, actually, that's not true. And I've done as much as possible to break down these barriers. But essentially, at the back of it, I, would, I will honestly, not trying to bash the government, but years ago, we used to have more money in the community to put community wardens. Who, community wardens were everywhere, so were community network developers. And that was their primary role, to be instigators in the community and they were like the eyes and ears of the community and a part of it I would say has contributed to all this lack of misinformation has been we've lost these eyes and ears that we had in the community so we are we as even we work but we're volunteers as well we work twice as hard to break down these barriers and we don't do it for money we do it because we are passionate about our roles and and advocating for these other communities for people to see the rich richness of what they bring to Bradford Mm, thanks. Yes. Adrian? Uh, sorry, um, I will. No, it's a good question. There's a great danger that we just exist in our own echo chambers where we're all mm -hmm. agreeing with each other and feeling quite good about ourselves and not actually engaging with, with people with very different opinions. Um, a, a key part of what we do is work, our schools are sanctuary project, working in schools with their understanding. And if you're going to change, um, change understandings in communities, you start with the young people. We're working in a project in conjunction with Bradford Council on critical thinking at the moment and developing resources to work in schools around that. Um, and we've been really, really encouraged to hear stories of children, you know, uh, from children who've gone back home with, a, with, with <laughs> uh, the experiences they've had in school and the things they've learnt and actually beginning to have an impact in their, in their own families. Clearly, uh, all educational establishments, Bradford University is a key one, mm. um, raising awareness and understanding here. Bradford College, Shipley College uh, are, are, are starting a really good journey. Well, they're not starting a journey, but they're starting a journey with us at the moment, which is really excellent. So education, young people. Media is always a challenge. Um, fortunately, in Bradford, we've generally had a, lo a sympathetic local media, but clearly... Trust, public trust in media is, 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 mm. is, is fragmenting and so we have to be trying to take advantage of, of as many channels as possible. I'm of a certain age <laughs> and, and sort of a, l l <laughs> somewhat of a Luddite. I'm not ahead of the game but fortunately we have others who are far more adept at using Twitter, um, Facebook and other, you know, other channels and, and getting the message out there. So that's just, again, there's a, this is a starter for 10 question. I, we could mm. all talk for considerably mm. longer, mm. Um, but that's a mm. yeah, the beginning. Yeah. Yes. I mean, of course, this is a challenge that's in gener de and uh, generic to the theatre area, you know, obviously diversifying audiences and so on. And Absolutely, yeah, and there's a lot of places that are doing it right, and there's a lot of places that have a lot of work to do, including ourselves. You know, we're always improving. Um, but there was a really big moment for us where where a lot of our work was, as I say, touring on a kind of national scale and that was sort of what we were doing. But the, peop the audiences that would come and see the work already had some interest or some knowledge or some um, care about the, uh, the topics that we were raising in the work that we were making. Um, and so we would talk all the time about how do we how do we reach a, uh, how do we reach everyone else? Mm. Um, and I think it kind of comes back around to this idea of, of, of making, making these things or conversations more visible. Um, so, for example, if the work wasn't in a studio theatre in a, in, a, in a city, what if it was in, in Lister Park and then anybody passing by becomes the audience for that work? So I think there's some potential mm. there that we, we continue to ask questions mm. about, making, making those conversations happen in Definitely. places that people mutually use mm. and care for. 
um, those common spaces. I think that's something that, that we're quite interested in exploring at the moment. Yes, I have a colleague in my own department who's very interested in dealing with football clubs and football crowd. You know, that could be, uh, you know, quite an interesting mixing uh, pot that can be more. There's quite an interesting uh, area of football clubs for peace sort of uh, idea. And I can well remember in part of the post-construction, uh, reconstruction, post-war reconstruction that I was involved with in Sierra Leone, I, I, I helped guide a, pro, a series of programs and uh, part of it was just to offer communities small amounts of money to do things that would help community build alongside other things to do, in fact in my case to do with weapons handling and so on. Um, and in an amazing number of them it sort of said, what we really need is a football pitch and you looked at them <laughs> and you sort of hang on a minute, who is asking for this? But actually it was the whole community sort of mm -hmm. saying, we need something for youth to get engaged with and do all of that so, and so you know there are a whole range of areas there. So one of the questions that's just come in, I couldn't quite see the name of the person who asked it, but it came back to this issue of just the basic living conditions, access to good food, access to diverse food, healthy eating, a sort of and, and uh, you know and all of that. Of course you do offer these, so you've already yeah. mentioned that it's important. Um, I wonder whether you have any observations about where the bigger challenges are, those ones that maybe need to be engaged with beyond the voluntary level into, um, uh, you know, the city and, uh, and, you know, government level and so on. Well, it's Cathy. Sorry, I, I, I've just seen there. So, uh, so Cathy asked that question. So. Um, I, uh, there's so many answers. I mean, uh, it, it's very difficult to stay local when you answer this question. If, pe if asylum seekers in the system had more than six pound a day to live on, they might well be able to afford to, 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 to eat rather better. Um, for, for a long time, the, the, the money they got was in vouchers, which you could only be used at certain supermarkets, so not at charity shops, not at the local community run um, it, 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 food stores, which had food much more suited to their needs. Um, so, you know, access, a six pound a day, you can't travel very far, if anywhere at all. A five pound um, day pass for a bus is, isn't going to leave you, it's going to leave you one pound for the rest of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just the ability to travel. Um, the, uh, I've lost the question now, but the, yeah, that, that the those food, are fundamentals. The sort of food for access to food. No, that's great. Um, uh, Mo, do you have any thoughts? Uh, what we've, uh, there's um, a I can't remember what it's called. There's some uh, in churches. That's it. It collects all the f um, the food before it, uh, which is donated from the supermarkets. And what we do at Biosan, and, and I'm sure there's a lots of organisations that do this. We access that food, and we make us we try and build as many healthy packs out of that vegetables with cheese, meats, breads, and we probably give out about 50 food parcels a week. I believe that. Um, there's nothing wrong with um, picking up food that it should not go in the bin at all. I do believe any should, anybody should be able to access this food. And as, as far as I'm concerned, anybody should be able to take that food. And I know there's people, apart from asylum seekers, refugees, who need this food. So that is one way we have mm. tried to tackle the food, food problems yeah. for the group. Thanks, thanks very much. Anna, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, those are areas where... Um, Obviously, it needs it needs more investment. It's just mm. it's an impossible task to try to to try to improve people's health and well-being when there's that little investment in it. So I think yeah. that's yeah. I think it, it goes back to that thing of trying to um, hold those accountable where possible because it's it's people who work for organisations, particularly like Mo and and Will, the various um, branches that come out of City of Sanctuary. It's, it's those people who know what that actually looks like. So those are the people who need to be heard, who need to be mm. listened to because they see what's happening firsthand yeah. rather than just some data or statistics. No, I think that's right, um, absolutely. So Adrian, my colleague Adrian has asked a question of us all and it relates to the uh, 2025 City of Culture bid. Uh, it's obviously um, the preparing these bids can be um, moments of opportunity, even if you're, uh, you know, as you, uh, as you mobilise people behind various elements of the bid. Do you think, uh, uh, so do you have any reflections on how best to develop that bid and how to um, use the mobilisation of the bid in order to generate some of that, in order to address some of the reputational issues that we were talking about earlier, to do with Bradford as an area, but also some of the funding, some of the uh, some of the, those other more structural issues. Any thoughts, uh, Will? You're going to start with me. Um, I, th I, th I think, to an extent, to which the the, fe the 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 bid reflects the whole diversity of the, of, of skills and experience. You know, people like Emily who 
never knew she had those skills until they, she, she had the opportunity to, to, to tap into them. Yeah, I think then it will be a, a bid that is worthy of a city. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge really to get, to get out, to, to encompass the, you know, to, to release the, the skills and abilities and resource them in, in all sectors of the community rather than necessarily just the obvious ones. And I, yeah, I, I'm aware of a lot of good work that is going on already. I'm not in any way, there's no criticism of the work that's happening already. I think it's been brilliant. Um, but it certainly needs to make sure that it, 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 it encompasses all, all sectors and particularly in our, our sphere, people from refugee communities are able to contribute. Because, you know, as you know, 17 years ago, I arrived in the city and was amazed by the vibrancy and the energy and the creativity. Well, that was 17 years ago and things have, got, have only improved significantly since then. So we've got a lot to shout about. And I think, you know, we're, it, it, it's, we're not just looking for central government funding. As we inspire, you know, as we tell the good news, people will think, yes, Bradford's a place worth moving to. Um, there won't be so many empty, em empty properties. Uh, there, there, there will be, yeah, there, there'll be people coming in here wanting to work, to, to open businesses, to invest. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Hannah. I think there are other cities that have had significant cultural investment and in, in the journey have maybe lost a bit of their spirit. So I think that's something that Bradford would be really prepared to resist. That's very much my personal opinion, but it's just something that's felt, I think, in this city, that it's, it's got so much beating heart and there's so many small pockets of, of activity that that kind of broad brushstroke, look at, look at our culture, I don't think that would happen here. So I think that's something that's quite exciting. That's a very good point. Um, I, was, um, I feel as though the Bradford 2012 has been very supportive in a lot of projects that we recently set up. One of the projects we set up last year was a pilot project for Interculture Festival, which is predominantly um, Sam seeker, sanctuary seeker communities and supporting organisations, which we gave them a platform because it's sort of never done before. And we did loads of different activities from that. I do think it will put Bradford on the map because Bradford deserves to be put on the map because I, again, and I will say this again, that we do rival Leeds and London for its cultural melting pot and its heritages. And we should have, we should shout about that. I feel as though if people outside of Bradford and want to be negative about looking at Bradford in that silly moment, you know, of negativity, I'm not bothered because end of the day, we as Bradfordians are really proud of what we've achieved and what we know we can achieve. And, and also I think we then also provide the opportunity for other communities and cultures to get up and shout about it as well. So I think it'd be a really good thing for Bradford. No, that's good. Well, so do I. I, mean, I think that's, it's obviously an exciting opportunity. It's amazing how when you're preparing a bid, how often you think are structurally obliged to think creatively and to do things that you might not otherwise have done in order to start things up. A really interesting question has come up from Steph, which is what about rugby clubs for sanctuary or uh, <laughs> cricket clubs or, you know, night whatever it might be. Um, so, uh, so, you know, in other words, we have a city of sanctuary, we have a university of sanctuary. Those are movements. Um, but maybe there hasn't been, or so at least so far in our conversation, there hasn't been so much reflection on how you can build on um, other institutions that are not necessarily directly involved with this and sort of make those more welcoming, make those more, um, make those more you know, playing their role. Uh, so I, I think, um, I don't know whether any of you have a thoughts of that. There's probably good examples. I, I, my, I'm, just, I'm just trying to think of some of the examples that I think about to do with football clubs, of mm. not of sanctuary, but football yeah. clubs for peace and all of that sort of stuff that I was mentioning. But um, Will, I see you. Um, yeah. no, the simple answer is yes. Um, the, the only limiting factor is our ability as a small group to be uh, involved in the assessment and approval processes, very clear processes established nationally, which are fairly simple and straightforward. Um, we are a small group and I would love today to result in people thinking, yes, I want to get involved and want to join in with what Biosan and Stand of Me Council and yeah. City of Sanctuary are doing. Because really our, our, you know, our greatest um, need isn't for funding, it's for people, for people to get alongside and do the work that we're, you know, alongside us to bring your vision, expertise, experience. But just come back to the original question, yes, anybody, I mean, at the moment we're working, uh, with a festival of sanctuary, um, application of transport hub of sanctuary, shops of sanctuary, gardens of sanctuary, uh, we have the danger of being somewhat overwhelmed by the level of interest. So yeah. I, I don't want to put anybody off. I would say, yes, just contact us. However, we really do need more, more people um, to, to get involved in, in, in just you know, 
helping build the work that we're doing yeah. and to better manage the, the, the level of interest and demand, which is a lot, nice p place to be in. Yeah. Yes. There are some great resources as well about how you can bring that culture of welcome and hospitality into whatever existing organisations you already have. So I think that would be a really great place to start to see what things you're doing well already that might mm. make your organisation, however big or small, more welcoming to mm. people. Mm. And I could just say that you know, those, many of those resources are on the National City of Sanctuary website. It's a fabulous website, incredibly well stocked. So just look up cityofsanctuary.org and you'll find it. If you put Br Bradford in, you'll find City of Sanctuary Bradford as well. Mm. Mo, do you have any thoughts? I just feel like the word sanctuary is such a peaceful word. It draws people in. Um, people are more than welcome to come into Biosan and see how we operate. And if they want to volunteer, we'll be really appreciate it because the group is growing so we're always in need of volunteers so that's a, an invite to anybody who wants to join yeah no it's interesting and I mean, so what was that could you repeat the website there the so www dot um city of sanctuary or one word dot org yes um if you put forward slash at bradford uh, you'll get us i mean i think it would be um, so that's great. And so that, that, just to remind, is a place of tremendous resources in order to um, understand how to make an organisation or how to take an initiative within an existing organisation in order to meet the norms and principles of the City of Sanctuary movement, but also to learn some of the lessons of similar organisations that have done things and, and work through this. It also strikes me, I mean, when I was, I was just reading last night, you know, in the way that you do, um, that, uh, you know, how many cities Bradford is twinned with and uh, we haven't necessarily linked with some of our twinning, uh, um, uh, you know, areas of activity. You know, I'm sure those are separately resourced and so on. So that is very interesting. Um, I um, uh, I note, and as we're coming to, to unfortunately to the end, I note that there's been a lot of very positive comments in the chat, and so thanks very much from all of you participating who've contributed those chat, uh, those points, uh, mentioning how positive and how inspiring uh, have been the examples of the different projects, of the volunteers that have worked on them, of the uh, people from uh, who've sought sanctuary here and their contribution back, how inspiring that's been. Uh, uh, for them. So I just want to emphasize that and also some very positive uh, points in the chat to do with Bradford and, you know, in a sense, pushing back alongside the, uh, all of us to do with, uh, you know, anything other than a positive image. So there's a final uh, question, which we're almost close to time. So it's one or two words, which is how can we encourage young people from uh, asylum and refugee communities um, to uh, become involved. Is that a, cha a challenge and an issue? Obviously, you've already mentioned the schools. I should say that mm -hmm. we used to run a program from Peace Studies Department until the funding rang out, which is dealing with uh, conflict creatively uh, in schools. And uh, that's something that would be interesting to us. But um, anything about, uh, particularly about younger people getting involved? Uh, Mo, you've already made a plea. You want lots of younger volunteers for Biosan. Uh, and so that's certainly there. Any thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to personally, I'd like to really um, support the next generation of theatre makers to be working in this way. So we're doing lots of work and have got open doors for anybody who's, who's interested in learning more about the company. Our doors are wide open, so just get in touch. Yeah, thanks. And Will? And I mean, clearly, we'd love to see more pe young people involved with City San Sanctuary. What I would say also, wonderful organisations like um, Bradford Refugee Forum and Bradford African Com Communities uh, are doing really good work with young people and the wider community and need support and interest. Um, and obviously, as you've mentioned, the Schools of Sanctuary project is, is one. We'd l there's so much more we could be doing. Um, we are just, as I keep saying, very, very small. Mm. Uh, and, but there's, there's many, many, many opportunities that we're not really able to grasp hold of at the moment. This is probably one where we're, we're not as doing as well mm. as we could. Yeah, so there's lots of people that um, also welcome lots of opportunity to do this. Mm -hmm. And so please, um, anybody who, those people that are interested in that, make contact with their websites or make, um, uh, and also with the, you know, obviously the uh, people from the organizations represented on this panel, but all of those that have been part of the organizing uh, group here, um, uh, who are represented to some extent in the video and others too, please just get in touch if, um, if you want to get involved. And that obviously includes, from my perspective, students that are spending time at the University of Bradford. I know that they also, some of those also volunteer and that uh, they're very welcome uh, too, just as a, a specifically Bradford University point, uh, which 
aren't allowed as me. So um, with that, um, thanks so much to um, the panel. Thanks, thanks also to uh, Karina and Adrian for your support through this and to Anna and all of the team that have been pulling together and helping to organize uh, this, this event. I think we're, um, you know, we're just about uh, out of time now, so thanks. So with that, um, uh, if, um, uh, if you could, uh, I'll just sort of close up. So I think we have run out of time, unfortunately, now. And so um, if you, um, uh, if, uh, I hope you all enjoyed the panel. Um, in a little while, you'll see um, a, a website coming up, a poll pop up on Zoom. Please take a moment to fill it in. Uh, we'd be very grateful for that feedback. And don't forget that there's still a lot more um, Unify events to come tomorrow and Friday. So please visit the website to find out more. And the website is www.bradford.ac.uk slash Unify. Uh, but from all of us here, thanks to you. Bye -bye.